Good evening and blessings. Welcome to our online healing service. I'm Apostle Marquita Brooks, the National Coordinator for the Invitation Movement and the Ministry Leader of the Truth in the Spirit, which is the ministry that oversees the Invitation Movement. As you guys will recall, on Monday we entered Women's History Month, and so for this month we'll be looking a lot at women's issues, topics that have to do with women, women in the kingdom, and I want to encourage you to just allow the Lord to minister to you because this is a topic that involves everyone in the body and in the world. As women are, are the mothers and women, women are influencers and women are wives and sisters and friends um, and leaders. God has called women to many roles. The reality is we've got to understand how the Lord feels about women and issues concerning women. We've got to get into the right position that the Lord can actually work freely among all of us. And so I'll, tonight I'm going to talk to you on the topic to cherish and protect as we look at women and the unborn coming specifically out of the Declaration of Kingdom Standards for the United States of America. We want to make sure that you really see clearly um, the direction the Lord is giving us concerning women and the, the babies that women carry, that, 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 uh, that role that God has called women into. And this is the way we start issue uh, number two in the Declaration of Kingdom Standards for the United States of America. We'll look at the beginning of that and then we'll talk really about what that means for us and how we've got to address some things in our society. So let us pray and then we're going to go into worship led by Alan and Deborah Baisley. Hallelujah, Father, we lift you up and we worship you, Lord God, and we praise you even now that every person is fearfully and wonderfully made, knit together in their mother's womb. You use the womb of a woman, hallelujah, to to bring into the earth life. We thank you even now, Lord God, that you place your hand upon women all over the world. Minister to and through each one of us, Lord God. Put us in the right position that we might be helpers suitable to the men in our lives, that we might be the community members that you've called us to be, that we might be the standard bearers that you've ordained for us to be, and that we might co-labor with, with, our, with our brothers in the kingdom to do the work that you've ordained for all of us. We bless you that you are well able to do it, Lord God, and we invite you to have your way in this healing service. Move by the power of your spirit thwart every plan of the enemy, that his schemes will be thrown down, that we can have an amazing worship experience and receive revelation directly from your throne. In Shua's name we pray, amen and amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to turn it over to Alan and Deborah Baisley as they lead us in worship. Oh, 
persevering in prayer um, and continuing. We know there was challenges with the signal earlier, but I thank God that Alan and Debbie persevered. Elder Federica and I were interceding. We were praying because what, what a beautiful experience in worship. And I'm going to tell y'all that worship experience is so important because there are things that the Lord births when we're in his presence. There are things that the Lord does when we're in, in, in a place of worship. And it's so important that we come back to that place of worship that all of us might fulfill his purpose for us. And so today I'm actually going to speak to you guys on the topic to cherish and protect kingdom stand standards for the treatment of women and the unborn. But let me share this with you. This is so important to understand this. Today's message is certainly for women, but even more than that, today's message is for men. There is a role that we play in each other's lives. We are interconnected. It is not possible to address, you know, uh, kingdom standards for the treatment of women and not speak to men. It's not, it's not possible to talk about women being in their rightful roles and not also speak to men. It's the same thing is true about men. In order to, to lift up men and really actually put men in the roles they need to be, there also has to be ministry to women because God has made us interdependent. We're interconnected. And so I want to encourage you, fellows, don't check out tonight thinking that, oh, this is for the ladies or, or this month. Check out this month. <laughs> you think everything's going to be about women. The truth of the matter is God's will for women cannot occur unless men are also walking in agreement with him because there are roles that we all must play. And so I'm going to start by reading the first four paragraphs um, of the Declaration of Kingdom Standards under issue number two. This is actually is going to start on page five. So the bottom of page five, I'll start there. I'll read these first four paragraphs. I'm going to look at um, to cherish and protect kingdom standards for the treatment of women and the unborn. But then we're going to go to the scriptures and we're going to look at a beautiful example that the Lord gave us about how he, he protected the unborn and his chosen woman for a certain purpose by the, 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 the acts and the, the the choices of the woman, but then also by the acts and the choices of the man. This is so important because, again, we are all in this together. We're interconnected. And so for any one of us to fulfill our purpose, there has to be support and a cooperation from the others of us. And that's what the Lord is doing right now. This is why we even have a Women's History Month. Um, same thing for Black History Month. The whole point is to um, address issues that aren't often addressed to celebrate uh, uh, women in history who aren't often celebrated um, and to really open all of our eyes, the eyes of women and the eyes of men, the eyes of children, 
uh, open all of our eyes to see things much more clearly um, and to be in agreement with God and what he is doing in this time. And so I want to encourage you with that um, as we start here at the bottom of page five of, in the Declaration of Kingdom Standards for the United States of America um, in issue two, women's rights and abortion. And please know that you can find the Declaration of Kingdom Standards for the United States of America at nationalkingdomcouncil.org. You can also find the link to that on, on the Invitation Movement's website, which is invitationmvmt.org. And both of those are actually in um, the description for this video. So let us begin. And uh, this is how it reads, the first four paragraphs in issue number two in the Declaration. As we continue to reveal kingdom standards that lead to life, we must address the rights of those who have been created by God to bring life into this world women, and the rights of the unborn and recently born. In the beginning, God created the universe to include the earth, humankind, and all living things in creation. He made both men and women in his image, giving us dominion on earth and a responsibility to repopulate the earth or to populate the earth. Thus, women are infinitely valuable, as are all people, endowed by God with creative ability, love, and hope, which bring life and nurturing into our nation. Women are the mothers of humankind, given the special gift to bear babies and birth them into this life. The God, that God-given role is essential to the survival of all humanity and this nation. The role of mother is only one God-ordained role that women fulfill, and women are not defined by any role. The identity and purpose of each individual woman comes only from God and is not dependent upon her performance or the pleasure or profit someone else could receive from manipulating her. A woman's worth cannot be measured, and her identity and purpose can only be revealed by God through intimate fellowship with him. Like men, women have also been given creative ability from God and authority on earth, which leads to innovation and leadership that has been invaluable in establishing and sustaining this nation. Hence, women must be cherished and protected. Yet to demand such treatment, women must also be educated and supported. Rather than being cherished, protected, educated, and supported, women are often abused and manipulated by the men who claim to love them, family members and friends, and even by our society as a whole. This has never been the will of God. Though many people have misused biblical scriptures to oppress women, the Bible actually provides dignity, liberty, security, and protection for women. In the Bible, God rebukes even his priests for abusing and abandoning their wives. There are also various examples of women who served in vital leadership roles that changed the course of their nation and a beautiful example of a virtuous woman that is shared by a queen mother with her son, the king. In all of this, we see that the kingdom standard for women's rights is the same as the kingdom standard for men's rights. In the same way, the hierarchy of rights for female citizens of the United States is the same as for male citizens of the United States, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness or property, which is an in alignment with kingdom standards, with, with God's kingdom standards. As the bearers of life, we implore women in this nation to value life, even the life of an unborn baby in your own womb, above your own liberty expressed in your right to choose. Unborn and recently born babies have the right to life and must be considered American citizens as well. Just as the Bible protects the rights of women, the rights of unborn babies are also protected. In Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 through 25, the biblical law requires that anyone who harms an unborn baby in the womb must be punished by the exact same injury that was done to the baby. Life for life, eye for eye. This reveals very clearly that the kingdom standard for unborn babies is that they have the same rights as humans who have already been born and the same protection under God's law. What this means then is that abortion is murder as determined by the creator of all life himself. Now, with all that being said, we've got to really hear from God on this matter um, to cherish and protect human standards for treatment of women and the unborn. Now, I want to take you to two scriptures that are going to look at the Lord actually putting this into effect. And we've got to understand that, that his standards are the same. He actually has no favoritism. So what we see the Lord doing in this example, he does in all of our lives if we walk in agreement with him. See, what we're going to see here is that the woman 
and the man are brought into this place of agreement with God. They don't start there, but they're brought into the place of agreement with God. And for, and for that reason, the baby's life is protected. The woman's life is protected. The family and self as a whole, um, the, the husband, wife, baby are all protected because there's this agreement with the will of God. Now I'm going to take you to Luke chapter one, because we're going to start with the mother, the woman who is Mary, the mother of our Lord. And we're going to see some of those uh, uh, topics that we just looked at in the declaration. We're going to see them play out in the life of the, of the, of the woman chose, chosen to birth our Messiah into the earth, actually fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy. And so here we are in Luke chapter one, and I'm going to start in verse 26. As we're reading about this young woman, Mary or Miriam in Hebrew, and what the Lord speaks to her and how this plays out for a little while. Let's look at this. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city in the Galil called Nazareth or Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man named Yosef or Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Miriam or Mary. Approaching her, the angel said, Shalom, favorite lady, Adonai is with you. She was deeply troubled by his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, don't be afraid, Miriam, for you have found favor with God. Look, you will become pregnant, you will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Yeshua. He will be great. He will be called the son of Ha Elyon, that is the most high. Adonai, God, will give him the throne of his forefather, David, and he will rule the house of Yaakov, or Jacob, forever. There will be no end to his kingdom. How can this be, asked Miriam of the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered her, the Ruach HaKadosh will come over you. The power of ha el will cover you. Therefore, the holy child born to you will be called the Son of God. You have a relative, Elisheva, or Elizabeth, who is an old woman, and everyone says she is barren, but she has conceived a son and is in her six months pregnant. For God, for with God, nothing is impossible. Miriam said, I am the servant of Adonai. May it, be, may it happen to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Now let's, let's look at Miriam for a minute. And you guys may know her as Mary. Miriam, of course, is her uh, a name in the original Hebrew. We've got to remember, of course, all this is happening in Israel in the first century. And this is a young woman. She would have probably been like 14, 15 years old. This is a young woman. 14 is a really good historical uh, uh, reference for about the age that she was. In her culture, young women were trained from, from the time they could really walk and talk to become mothers, to become uh, wives to become contributing members of society. In um, first century Israelite culture, the, the young people were taught to take on the roles that they would fulfill in adulthood. So literally the, the way you rear children in this time is you train them in the ways that they will walk in as an adult. What we see in contemporary Western culture is the adults coming down to the level of the youth and playing with youth as young people are. So what happens is our children in our culture mature much later. And so their, their bodies are maturing because we're pumping them full of all types of stuff, um, but their maturity with regard to taking on domestic roles, that, that's a slower process because our, our mindset for rearing children is to, 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 for us, the adults to come down to their level and teach them on their level, to interact on their level, talk like them, interact with them the way they are, as opposed to in uh, Eastern culture, which is what we're looking at here, the, the goal is to bring the children up to the adult level and start to train them in the ways that they will walk in. So at this age, she is engaged to be married. Now let's talk about what a biblical engagement looks like. When we're looking at Jewish culture in the first century, it would mean that the two families have come together and have agreed that this young woman and this man uh, Joseph would have been probably a few years older than her because he's got to be in a position where he can provide for her and, and for a child. Um, the, 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 their two families have agreed that the two of them are going to be engaged. Uh, Joseph would have brought dowry to her, to her father, a gift, a blessing to him for blessing him to be able to marry his daughter. Of course, she was a virgin. We know that is the truth. And that would have been true of most maidens at this time, um, being prepared for marriage, being saved for marriage, being protected 
um, they have their virtue protected for marriage, um, that they could, that their husbands could be honored by, you know, marrying a virtuous young woman. Um, and they would have had a, a ceremony, an engagement ceremony, uh, where they drank from the same cup. Um, and, 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 and the blessing is spoken over it. And then that they're seen now by the community as um, a couple. They're seen now as a married couple. But for one year, she doesn't go into his house. He goes away from her for one year and he builds a house. He builds a house that will sustain her and their children. And then in that year, while he is going away to prepare a place for her, this is why the Lord used that language for us, because we are his bride. He said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. We're betrothed to him. We're married, but we're not living in the same house right now. He is in heaven preparing a place for us. What we're supposed to do is what Mary was, was doing during this year was learning about this particular man that she is now married to. She was learning from his mother, his aunt's her mother, other women in the community, how to be a, a wife to this particular man, the things he liked, what he didn't like, like this is what this year was for, to groom her specifically for him and for him to build the house for her. And But they're completely set apart. They're not with anyone else. Everybody in the community sees them as married, but they weren't supposed to live together, which means that there shouldn't have been any offspring produced yet. Why? Because the husband hasn't yet built the house. You see what I mean? The house hasn't been built for the, the, the children to be birthed into. So there's not a there's not a place, a home that they could protect this child these children in yet. So no one's gonna touch her, no one's supposed to tempt him. Everybody's supposed to 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 uh, see that their that their relationship is sanctified and it's set apart. They're supposed to respect the relationship and help them, you know, to do the two things they're supposed to do, build the house to protect the family and learn about this man so that she could be a good a helper suitable to this particular man. That's what was happening in this year, okay? But they are considered married, um, but not living together yet. In this time, it's during this year that the angel approaches her. And it's important that you understand this. God could have had the angel approach her prior to this year, prior to the, to the engagement, prior to the betrothal. Um, the Lord could have had the angel approach her prior to this. He chose to wait until she was in covenant relationship with a man. That was a choice. The Lord did that on purpose. That was a specific choice. God does everything intentionally. So it's during this year that the angel then comes to her. Now, let me tell you where Miriam lives. She lives in Nazareth, which is going to be a poor town. Um, very, you know, rural. It's in a rural area. Not a lot of, um, of the, the conveniences you would have seen in the bigger cities. Um, like Jerusalem is a big city, so there's lots of things happening there, lots of stuff going on, a big city. Nazareth is a very small, rural, poor town. Um, they do everything by hand. You know, they don't have a lot of the conveniences. They don't have all the markets that a lot of the other places surrounding them have. So they want some pretty things, some nice new things. They have to leave Nazareth and go into a, big, a bigger town to get those things and then come back home. And so she knows, you know, she's a simple girl. Uh, she, she, she's living in a small poor town and this angel comes and says shalom favorite lady Adonai is with you and she's like what I'm a regular old young woman in a poor town we really have a whole lot going on here very small it's a very small town if you've been to Nazareth they rebuilt it just like it was in the first century very small and so she's not understanding why she's being greeted by this angel that she's favored, that the Lord is with her. And it's important that you get that because when we read in the declaration a minute ago, it says that, that a woman's value is immeasurable and her purpose and identity can only be revealed by God. Even Mary didn't see herself as the Lord saw her. Even she devalued herself somewhat. Certainly she was humble. We know she was humble. But more than just humility, she did not see herself as God saw her. So the angel is intentionally greeting her this way because the angel is trying to speak identity into her. The angel is trying to speak purpose into her that she would understand even though she's a humble person and living in this humble town, that God has an amazing plan for her life. And, and this is important that we get that because what we find is that people who believe that they are important, people who have an inkling of their identity and their purpose are going to make much more, um, they're going to make decisions that really protect that identity and purpose. 
They're going to make decisions that, that, that protect everything of value that's concerning them. But when they don't necessarily see their identity and purpose, they're much more likely to make harmful decisions because it is their right to choose. We find this among a lot of young women who get pregnant and they're not married. Now, of course, we know Mary had experienced um, the, the betrothal, though, but she had not yet experienced the, the, the full marriage under the hoopah. And so with understanding that what this means then is that there was still a, a possibility of tremendous shame here, that she was not supposed to be touched by anyone, not even her husband, her betrothed at this time. And so not only does she see herself as, as very humble, you know, simple girl, poor town, but this proposal that's coming from this angel that she would be with child is like, okay, this could also bring tremendous shame to me. It's absolutely going to interrupt all of her plans. Anything she had planned for her life, beautiful wedding, all this stuff, none of that is, is going to happen. This is all being interrupted by the fact that now she's going to be pregnant. And this is so important that you understand that because so many young women find themselves in that position where they've made some plan for their life. They're going to go to school. Maybe they want to start a career. Their family members are looking forward to them doing something that's going to make the family proud of them. And then they find out that they're pregnant. And this is important that we get that because pressure comes from all types of directions. All types of directions of pressure comes upon these young women. But young women who have an inkling of their identity and of their purpose, young women who have received a word from God that they are valuable to him, that they are important to him, are much more likely to make decisions that would choose life and health for themselves and their unborn babies than young women who do not see themselves that way. And this is why it's so important for everybody, for all of us, to, to have a concept of the way God sees us, to, to really have a, a, a solid foundation of our own identity and purpose even if you don't know everything we'll never know everything about ourselves and everything we're designed to do until we're really face to face with the lord but when you have a solid self-esteem a solid self-image even when things happen that weren't necessarily what you planned you still have a trust in god and you believe that you can still fulfill your purpose but if you're in a place where you're really already your, 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 your self-esteem is, is, is not very healthy. It's kind of low. You're concerned about your circumstances and you're, you're feeling all this pressure from outside voices who are not called to be the steward of this baby that you now are carrying. Young women find themselves oftentimes forced into choices that if they were really left alone by others and really just, just supported and educated, allowed to really make their own decisions, they would make oftentimes completely different decisions for themselves. We've seen lots and lots of young women in our own personal lives, and I'm sure you guys probably know women as well, who a lot of people around them push them into abortions and things like that because the people around them were afraid for them. The people around them got concerned. Oh, all your plans are going to change. All your life is going to change. And, and this is so important that we understand that because the mother of our Lord was no different. The scriptures don't tell us about all the pressure that she received, but the Lord did not, it wasn't a matter of fact thing that the Lord tells her, your older relative, Elisheva or Elizabeth is also pregnant and the people thought she was barren. She's in her sixth month. That was not just, well, let me just throw this out there because we know she's going to visit Elizabeth. Mary was not foolish. The angel tells her Elizabeth is Elizabeth is also expecting a baby. She was thought to be barren. It's a miracle. Both of you guys are going to be pregnant. Mary mo removes herself from, from a doubting environment because she's still working out her own faith and goes to stay with the relative that the angel has told her has faith. Not only faith, but is experiencing a very similar miracle. She takes herself out of the environment that might cause her to actually abort her own purpose and the purpose of the baby in her womb. Now, I'm sure they didn't carry out abortions the, the same way we have we do now, but I'm telling you, since the times of pregnancy, women have been doing certain things to themselves if they had a pregnancy that they, didn't, they weren't ready for to abort babies. And not only that, there was a possibility of people stoning her to death 
thinking that she had committed adultery against Joseph. There's a possibility of her own father um, being aggressive toward her, thinking that she had, you know, spoiled the family name. She great, great, you know, created this terrible reputation. So she removes herself from that situation. We don't see anything happening in her family home because the truth is, before they even find out she's pregnant, Mary's already gone. She leaves the situation and she goes to Elizabeth. And so the gospel writers tell us all these great things. They tell us these wonderful things of what happens when she shows up to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth then gives her this beautiful confirmation because John or Yohanan in, 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 in Elizabeth's belly leaps when Mary shows up. And then Elizabeth prophesies to her so that she knows, oh, wow, you know, too, I'm not crazy. I am carrying the son of God. I'm glad, you know, you confirmed that for me. And then Mary has this, says, of course, this wonderful song where she gives God all this glory. But she's sent to a place that builds her faith. She's sent to a place that will protect the seed that is within her. This is an important revelation, you guys. We got to get this. The Lord has the angel to give her information that she would not otherwise know. They didn't have Instagram. They didn't have any cell phones where they could text to call each other. She would not have known Elizabeth was pregnant. It's not something she would have found out. The angel tells her Elizabeth is pregnant. She plans to go there. She goes there before she starts showing, before anybody knows she's pregnant. And she's brought into not just a place that's physically safe for her, but a place where now even her faith is safe. Her decision to become the mother of this baby is now going to be protected. It's going to be protected in this environment with Elizabeth because Elizabeth's husband has also heard from the same angel that they were going to have a son. And Elizabeth gets a witness in her own spirit when Mary shows up. So now she's got someone to have faith with. And this is so beautiful because we know the scripture says when two or three are gathered together, there he, the Lord will be in the midst. And so, of course, we know that she had the Messiah in her belly and he's got the spirit. He had the spirit from conception because he's conceived by the Holy Spirit. But now she's got a peer and even an older mentor, someone she respects, someone whose opinion she, she, she appreciates, who is now able to sow seeds of faith and agree with her in faith so that she can actually protect this purpose that she's now been called to, which is it's a very important assignment. When God calls us to motherhood, it's not something to take lightly. It is a calling. It is an assignment. It is part of our purpose that the Lord calls you to motherhood. Not all women are called to motherhood. Women have different roles and different things God has us to do. But if he calls you to motherhood, then absolutely you're going to need that, that, that protection and that faith to be encouraged so that you can actually carry out that assignment the way God ordained for you to do it. And so this is what we see. She chooses to go to this place where not only her, her faith and her physical safety will be protected, but the baby in her womb will also be cherished and show shall see. And this is so beautiful because the Lord sends her to a place where she's going to receive the protection and to be cherished as this mother of the Messiah, the Messiah himself will be cherished. In the meantime, while this is happening in this particular environment, let's go to Matthew chapter one. I'm going to start um, in verse 18. We're going to see what the Lord was doing in Yosef or Joseph. He says, here is how the birth of Yeshua, the Messiah took place. Matthew chapter one, this is verse 18. When his mother Miriam was engaged to Yosef, before they were married, she was found to be pregnant from the Ruach HaKodesh. Her husband-to-be, Yosef, was a man who did what was right. So he made plans to break the engagement quietly rather than put her to public shame. Now, in other versions, it says he had planned to divorce her quietly. Now, what that means is he was going to give her a certificate of divorce. And you go, wait a minute, they were just engaged. But it was considered marriage. It was considered marriage in uh, a first century Jewish culture. So literally, in order for the engagement to be broken, a certificate of divorce would have to be released to her from Joseph. They couldn't just say, okay, I'm, you know, I don't really want to marry you anymore. Let me give you your ring back. Let me give you your dowry back because it would have been just the dowry that was given at that time. No. Literally, he had to give her a certificate of divorce because they are considered by the community and even made a covenant before God that now they are going to be together for as long as they both shall live. So he was planning to give her a get, which is a certificate of divorce, um, which is what you see in the original Torah, where he would write that he's divorcing her 
and send her back to her, you know, to her father's house that now she would be remarried if someone chose to remarry her. And this is important. The reason he was going to do it quietly is because he could bring her before the entire community, say she became pregnant within the year of our betrothal and I've never been with her, which means in, in, in you know, man's reasoning, the only other option is adultery. She committed adultery. And the, the Torah would have required that she be stoned because she is in covenant relationship with him at this time. And this is so important that we get that. He, he was trying to avoid that. And he was using his own wisdom to figure out how he was going to solve this problem with her having slept with someone else. But we know that that's not what happened. So look at the Lord intervene. Look at verse 20. But while he was thinking about this, an angel of Adonai appeared to him in a dream and, and said, Yosef, son of David, do not be afraid to take Miriam home with you as your wife, for what has been conceived in her is from the Ruach HaKadosh, she will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Yeshua, which means Yah saves, because he will save his people from their sins. All this happened in order to fulfill what Adonai had said to the prophet, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. That's in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. This name, Emmanuel, means God with us. When Yosef awoke, wait, when Yosef awoke, he did what the angel of Adonai had told him to do. He took Miriam home to be his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until she had been given, until she had given birth to a son and he named him Yeshua. Now, let's look at the important things that are transpiring right here. Young woman, poor town, sees herself very humbly, possibly even with a low self-esteem. Angel speaks purpose and identity into her. She accepts it. She says, may it be unto me as the Lord has said. She accepts it. When the Lord speaks into her through this angel, she accepts what the Lord says. She accepts who the Lord says she is. She accepts what the Lord is calling her to do. This is very important. And then the angel gives her some information that her older cousin, her older relative is with child, but she was thought to be barren. She's in her old age and she's been a six month. So Miriam removes herself from a, a particular, a, a potentially dangerous situation a potentially doubtful situation, a potentially scandalous situation, and goes to Elisheba's house or Elizabeth's house where her faith is increased, where she's going to be cherished and she's going to be protected. While she's there, the Lord is now speaking to the man betrothed to her, the man that's in covenant with her. And he speaks to this man because this man doesn't know who he's married. He doesn't know her true identity or purpose either. Now the Lord speaks it into the man. He's not hearing from the woman. I've been chosen by God to bear his son. No, no, no. God is speaking it into him. And when God reveals to Joseph who this woman is, that he's married, Joseph then treats her in accordance with the identity and the purpose that God has revealed. And this is so important. Husbands, young men, men of all ages, I need you to get this. You should not have any dealings with any woman, especially on like an intimate romantic level, until God has revealed to you who she is. You've got to be able to see her as God sees her. Not for, you know, her physical appearance, not for those things that attract you to her because you will never be able to cherish and protect her if you don't know her God-ordained identity and purpose. And like I said, we'll never know everything on this side of heaven. But you got to wait till God gives you a seed. You need a seed about her identity. You need a seed about her purpose because your job will be to cherish and protect her. When the Lord first came to Miriam, see, Mary had to say yes. She had to receive her identity and her purpose. She was the first one that had to receive it. And this is true, ladies. If you don't know who you are and you don't know what God is really putting you to do, you don't have to know all of it. Just have an inkling that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, that you're put here for a purpose. But if you don't know that, nobody else is going to know. Very important that you get that. You got to know it first. You got to seek God first, that he can tell you who you are. Because if you don't, the enemy and all other types of other people are going to tell you who you are. And those seeds will stick. They will stay because you're empty, because there's nothing there. There's no identity or purpose there. You've got to go to the Lord. Let him tell you who you are. Let him give you an inkling of your purpose. That way you can start, be the first person 
to cherish and protect your identity and purpose. You'll be the first one to do it. You'll demand that people treat you a, a certain way. You'll demand respect. And, and this is so important because young women who don't really know who they are or young women who've been abused and attacked and neglected have a very hard time doing that. And this is where we see young women behaving promiscuously or recklessly because that they have not been cherished and protected and they don't have that idea from God, that, that seed from God as to who they are and what they've been put here to do. So they're not protecting themselves either. And this is very important that we get it. A woman's not designed to protect herself by herself. This is why she's first in her father's house, who's also supposed to be seeking God as to who his daughters are that you would understand their identity and purpose so you can cherish and protect them and then hand them off to the right husband or if they choose not to be married, that you can support them in their choices in life. See, fathers, you can't be a father to your children if you've not asked God about each one of those children. If you don't know who they are, you can't speak identity and purpose into them because he's got to tell you who they are. It's the Lord who reveals identity and purpose. So what we see here is that Mary receives it from God. She receives what the angel says. She says, yes, she agrees. So when the spirit guides her to shift, to move from her father's house, where she may not be cherished and protected in that season, they don't understand what's going on, she shifts, she's cherished and protected there. So important, ladies, so important, ladies, that we listen to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Before any man or other human is our covering, our leader, our guide, or our mentor, our protector, God is first. God is first. And I'll tell you, every time in my life, that I've shared you guys my my, my testimony has been uh, raped multiple times, molested, abused, all types of things. When I look back at every one of those situations, because in order for God to heal me, I have to let him take me back to those situations. Every time, he had to take me back to each one of those instances. And he had to talk to me and had to show me what I didn't see. Every time he took me back, you know what I saw? That the Lord had spoken something to me prior to it happening. He gave me some type of way of escape or some type of red flag. There was a red flag. Oh, something's not right. Mm -mm, I probably need to get out of here or I, I may not need to be in a relationship with this person. Like he gave me some type of red flag or some type of way of escape, some type of ink and something in my spirit. But I, I was at that time too immature to identify that that's what it was, that it was the Lord. It's like, oh, that's crazy. I've known this person you know, my whole life. Oh, that's crazy. I, I dismissed those warnings. I dismissed those inklings from the Lord. But you got to know this, ladies that before anybody else can cherish or protect you, the Lord is the first one who's doing it. And he will start to speak to you about you. Never, ever, ever second guess your intuition. If something feels off, it's probably off. If you feel like probably I need to get out of here, you probably do need to get out of there. Listen to your intuition because what that is, is it's the Lord cherishing and protecting you. It's the Lord trying to guide you to safety. Mary, listen, the angel didn't tell her, leave where you are and go to Elizabeth's house. Angel didn't say that. The angel just said Elizabeth was pregnant in her six months and she was thought to be barren. Mary went, I hear you, Holy Spirit, and packed her back. <laughs> you see what I mean? She she took the inkling. She went, oh, oh, you're not just telling me that for no reason. She, her spirit was sensitive enough that she took, the, 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 she understood that the Lord was revealing that for a reason and she went to Elizabeth's house. We know what happened there. She was tremendously blessed. While there, the Lord was preparing her spiritual house with her husband, Joseph. He was supposed to be building a natural house, but the Lord was preparing the spiritual house. And what I mean by that is that the Lord was speaking into Joseph, what Joseph was going to need to know about Mary and about this baby, so that Joseph could then become the next person to cherish and protect them. So when she comes back from Elizabeth's house, it says very clearly that as soon as Joseph had this dream, he took her into his house. Well, we know she was at Elizabeth's house. So this means that when she came back, she comes right back from Elizabeth's house. What does Joseph do? He takes her into his house. God is perfect in his timing. And he will provide for us. He'll protect us. He'll keep us. But it requires a, a, an important and intimate fellowship with him. You can't have a casual relationship with God and, and, and allow him to use you in these types of ways that we see him using Miriam and Lashiva. And Yosef, he used the three of them in amazing ways because they were very sensitive to him. They were really listening. And so they were able to cherish and protect Mary. They were able to cherish and protect Yeshua because they were listening. You, you, of course, you read later 
that um, in, in chapter two, that the Holy Spirit wakes Joseph up in the middle of the night after they go to Bethlehem. And he says, you got to leave here. You got to go to Egypt. Somebody's trying to kill the baby. Again, Joseph being sensitive. And he, and he moves in agreement with the spirit of the Lord. But I'm going to tell you right now, if a seed of identity and purpose is not sown into you about the woman, about the, the child, there won't be this sensitivity. There won't be this movement with the Lord. See, Joseph understood this woman is precious. This child is precious. Can, can I let you in on a little secret? Every woman and every child are precious. Every single one. Every single one is precious in the eyes of the Lord. And when those who are, 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 are assigned to the women and those who are assigned to the unborn children and, of course, to continue in the lives of those children, when those who are assigned to the women and children get an understanding of how precious they are in God's sight, the sensitivity to the Holy Spirit's instructions, even people who may not even have a strong relationship with God, the fact that they love the woman and appreciate who she is, her identity and purpose, the fact that they love this unborn child or even the child after it's born and appreciate its identity and purpose will cause that love will cause the sensitivity to increase because they're concerned, because they're loved, because they're invested. And, and this is something we've got to look at as a community. We've got to look at this as a community because many of the women we see going through all types of challenges and the 6 million babies who were aborted in this nation, it's only possible to happen because those who were assigned to the women, those who were assigned to the babies, one in three women has been raped. Those assigned to them haven't got an inkling, a real understanding of the women's identity and purpose, of the baby's identity and purpose. So they can't really hear the instructions they need to hear to cherish and protect them as they need to be cherished and protected. But please know this, for God to allow us to be stewards over life is a great responsibility. It's, it's something he entrusts us with. He doesn't have to. He can allow you know, babies to pop up spontaneously like weeds in a garden. He could, have, he could have done it just like that. He didn't choose to do that. He wanted to make us stewards. He wanted us to know what it felt like to cherish and protect something, to birth it, to nurture it up, to, to, to guide it, to parent it. He wanted us to connect with the way he feels about us. So he gave us this tremendous responsibility but it is not a responsibility that we can handle rightly unless we have heard from him the identity and the purpose of those we're supposed to cherish and protect. And so I really hope that this inspired you, mothers, to think about your children, fathers, to think about your children and, and really ask God about them. Because you see here in, in, in Matthew chapter one, in verse 25, it says that Joseph, name Yeshua. Joseph is the one that heard the name from the angel. Joseph is the one that gave him the name. In Genesis chapter 2, Adam is the one that names all the animals. It is the, it is the uh, role of the man to speak identity, to speak that into his children and even into his wife. And so we see Joseph fulfilling it, but I want to encourage you, gentlemen, fellows, to really pray about your children because whatever you tell them they are, that's what they will be. What are you prophesying into your children? Same thing for your wives. What are you speaking into your wife? I'm telling you, it, it, when you speak into someone who God says they are, you will reap the beautiful fruit of that. But when you put people down and you tell them the things you don't like about them and all the stuff you want to change, that type of negativity that the brain actually incorporates all of that and it actually causes someone to become the very things you don't want them to become. And this is true for all of us because we know that, that you know, uh, the power of life and death is in the tongue. And so we want to make sure that we are really hearing from God, identity and purpose, so that we can cherish and protect and we can speak life the way he wants us to speak life, but so that we can actually steward life the way he's called us to steward life. I want to encourage you, if there are women in your life, really seek God about them because they may not have heard from him who they are. 
and, 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 and the fact that he created them for a purpose. But if you hear something on their behalf, speak life into them. The people need that seed, especially women. We see it in our, in our society a lot. A lot of things are spoken over women, even little growing up, um, that, that really cause them not to see themselves the way God would want them to, be, to see themselves. It is not in alignment with his view of them. We've got to change that narrative. We got to change the way women see themselves. I want you to see every young woman from now on as married. You don't know what God's will is for her. It can be amazing. I guarantee you it's amazing. Ask him just to give you a seed. And when you get any good seed about her, you speak it into as much as you can. And we got to remember to do that. Our young men need to. This is why I'm saying for all children, all of our young people need it. And of course, women as helpers suitable, you got to bless your husbands as well. You got to encourage him. Men get beat up enough in the world. When they come home, they should be blessed by their wives. They should be encouraged by their wives. They should know that their wives are on their side, on their team, and supporting them in everything that they do. See, all of this is important. We see this alignment happening between Mary and Joseph. Mary didn't ask Joseph any questions when he said, all right, we got to get up and go to Egypt because somebody's going to come and kill the baby. She didn't go, God didn't tell me that. She wasn't fighting. She was, oh, you heard from Lord? Okay. She walked in agreement. And, and, and they were able to do everything God told them to do. In a marriage, God may not speak to both people. But if he speaks at all, whoever hears from God, capture it, share it with the other one immediately. And you guys go into prayer so that you can be in agreement and God can do what he wants to do. Cherish and protect each other because stewardship over lives is really what God has called us to. And it's the most important thing we can do. Let us pray. <sighs> Hallelujah, Father. We thank you for revealing to us how special and important each person is tonight. We thank you for calling us to be faithful in this mission and this responsibility to cherish and protect life and the lives and the identities and the purposes of those around us. We lift up women before you. We lift up the unborn before you, Lord God. And we thank you that your hand is upon them. We thank you, Lord God, that you yourself cherish and protect them, that you have a will that is ordained for each and every one, including the men and the young men. And we ask that you have your way among all of your people, Lord God. Thwart the plans of the enemy, Lord God. Reveal his wicked schemes and sow your truth of identity and purpose into your people all over the world. We thank you for a special hedge of protection around women. We thank you for a special hedge of protection around the unborn, young children, the weak, the infirm, Lord God. We thank you for a special hedge of protection around the doubting, no matter who they are, so that they might have faith sown into them and that doubt uprooted and removed. We bless you that you are well able to do it, Lord God, and we commit our identities and purposes to you. And we say if there's anything that we need to know that we don't know, or anything we need to know about our own children, our own spouses that, we, that we've not yet received from you, we ask that you reveal it so that we can sow into them, that we can speak life, that you can have your way in their lives as we cherish and protect them. We praise you for it and we bless you for it. In the truth's name, amen. Now, I want to sing the ironic blessing over you as an encouragement for you to bless others in your life. Even if you don't know how to sing it in Hebrew, even if you don't remember the melody in English, you can always find the ironic blessing in Numbers chapter 6. You can open the Bible up, but bless the people in your lives. They, they need the blessings. You have no idea how much people need it. Ya e ya de pana eleka ve honeka isa ya de pana ve leka ve asem la kashalom ve asem la kashalom. Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh shine his face upon you. Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh shine his face upon you. And be gracious unto you. May Yahweh 
to look upon you and give you his shalom and give you his shalom. It's in Yeshua HaMashiach. In Yeshua's name I pray. Amen and amen. Be blessed and bless someone else. See you guys again soon.